last but not least, we have Mike Van Elzacker. He is a postdoc at MGH. He is a, a new member of the Mass Peace Action Board, and he's going to talk about the crisis in Korea and what can be done about it. Okay, hi everybody. Um, so I really appreciate you staying. I hope you don't mind if I talk for 10 minutes about Korea. So I got my timer right here. I'm going to keep myself honest, so I promise I will shut up in 10 minutes. Um, so just as, just as a little warning, I, mean, I am going to talk about the Korean War. Um, nothing sort of specific and graphic, but I'm going to give some sort of um, background and statistics and sort of, and that involves, um, you know, the Korean War did involve sexual violence as well. Um, okay, so we're here to talk about um, nuclear weapons overall, right? So um, everybody knows that the, uh, you know, the Hiroshima bombing happened on August 6, 1945. Estimates are 146,000 killed. Um, the next, or three days later on August 9th, 1945 in Nagasaki, about 80,000 were killed. Um, but what a lot of people don't know is that the following day, August 10th, 1945, two U.S. State Department officials took down a map from the wall and drew a line across the Korean Peninsula. And that's why we have a North and South Korea. There were no Koreans consulted. Um, this was a unilateral United States action that divided Korea in half. Um, and sort of that, that's still the crisis that we're dealing with today is, um, you know, the Korean Peninsula, which had been unified, a, a shared language and culture for millennia, um, sort of split in half artificially without um, any consent or input. Um, and that's what Korean people are taking the lead now to, to undo what uh, the U.S. did so long ago. And we've talked a little bit about um, letting the Korean peace movement be our guide. Um, and we should sort of follow their lead, and I'm going to try and uh, explain why we ought to be doing that and, and some things that we're doing to try and actually uh, manifest that. Um, so, you know, why did that happen the, the three days after um, the Nagasaki bombing? Uh, in 1910, Imperial Japan took Korea as a colony um, and ran Korea as a colony um, for 35 years until 1945. And it was, of course, like most colonial endeavors, brutal uh, and awful. And that included the taking of hundreds, tens of thousands of Korean women as so-called uh, comfort women um, for, yeah, as essentially sexual slaves for the Japanese Imperial Army. This is something that still um, causes a lot of tension between Koreans and uh, between especially South Korea and Japan. Um, President Abe has not been good about recognizing it and he has given sort of vague um, vague apologies, um, but th this is sort of the legacy of imperialism that the Korean people have been fighting against for so long. Um, and of course, there was an anti-imperial movement that sprang up during this period. Uh, and when the US took over South Korea in 1945, um, the United States Army ran South Korea essentially as a colony for three years. A lot of people don't know that. There was a, what's called the US Army government in Korea that actually ran the place. And they kept in place Japanese collaborators. So they kept in place the, essentially the, the colonial infrastructure. Um, and of course, Koreans didn't like that. Um, and they began sort of fighting back. There was a continuation of the anti-imperialist movement um, that had, that had uh, arisen during the period of colonial um, occupation. So, um, you know, there were skirmishes that sort of escalated, and of course the United States at the time, well, probably still is, but obsessed with anti-communism. And so they took this imperial grassroots movement, often among you see, sort of uneducated peasants just trying to organize to get foreign invaders off their land, they took that as sort of doctrinal communism, and they clamped down on it very hard. So we just uh, three or four days ago, past the 70th anniversary of the Jeju uprising of April 3rd, um, in which probably 30,000 people in Jeju Island, the, uh, off the southern tip of Korea, were killed, largely by um, US-supported uh, Japanese um, collaborator, um, is essentially the military and police infrastructure that was left behind from colonial Japan, as well as uh, you know right-wing youth gangs that were you know organized and supported by the United States. So that was probably about one fifth of the population of Jeju Island that were murdered, sometimes systemically. Um, and again, that's way in the south, and this is before 
June 25th, 1950, when we usually consider the Korean War to have started. So that's sort of evidence that the Korean War was already going and escalating, and it was largely an anti-imperial struggle. Um, again, Koreans know this history, and this is why we should sort of defer to them and let President Moon take the lead and do what we can to keep our leaderships just sort of out of the way. Um, the Korean War itself was sort of uniquely brutal and it was considered brutal and racist at the time, which is something. Um, so just some numbers. Um, during the entire Pacific theater in World War II, about, let me get the numbers here. Um, during the entire Pacific theater in World War II, um, approximately 35,000 tons of bombs were dropped. So, th excuse me, 350,000 tons of bombs were dropped. That's the entire Pacific theater. So in just Korea, largely in the north, in the three year period that we call the Korean War, 635,000 tons of bombs were dropped. So this is 24 hour saturation bombing. Um, that was, again, um, and just as some example, napalm was used extensively. So in a four month period in 1950, the United States dropped 866,000 gallons of napalm on North Korea. During the total three years of the Korean War, the United States dropped over 32,000 tons of napalm, mostly north but also south. So just to drive home the idea that it was considered brutal and racist at the time, a brutal racist Winston Churchill had the following to say. I do not like this napalm bombing at all. This was in a, a, a file memorandum that was filed August 22nd, 1952. It ended up not being released publicly for fear of embarrassing his ally, but this is him raising concerns about the extent of napalm bombing. Um, a fearful lot of people must be burned, not by ordinary fire, but by the contents of the bomb. We should make a great mistake to commit ourselves to approval of a very cruel form of warfare affecting the civilian populations. Napalm in the war was devised by and used by fighting men in action against tanks and against heavily defended structures. No one ever thought of splashing it about all over the civilian population. I will take no responsibility for it. It is one thing to use napalm in close battle or from the air in immediate aid of ground troops. It is quite another to torture great masses of people with it. So understand, that's the North Korean perspective. That's what they're thinking when twice annually the United States with Japan and South Korea, properly called Republic of Korea, um, engage in very large scale military exercises off the coast. And Cole, I apologize, my timer didn't work, so you're gonna have to tell me when to be quiet at 10 minutes. Um, Four minutes to go. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> So um, again, just to drive home um, the, the sort of North Korean perspective, why they th believe that they need nuclear deterrent. Um, Douglas MacArthur testified on May 3rd, 1951. Now again, this is barely a year into this conflict. Douglas MacArthur testified the following to the US um, Congress. Quote, the war in Korea has already almost destroyed that nation of 20 million people. I have never seen such devastation. I have seen, I guess, as much blood and disaster as any living man, and it just curdled my stomach the last time I was there. After I looked at that wreckage and those thousands of women and children and everything, I vomited. If you go on indefinitely, you are perpetuating a slaughter such as I have never heard of in the history of mankind. So does that give a little perspective about why North Korea sort of looks the way that it does? Why it's sort of a garrison state that's deeply dug in, extremely militarized, um, you know, that they're in, a, in they're in an extreme defensive posture and have been for a long time. Now understand that they're a former signatory to, we time? Okay. They're a former signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. They withdrew. Um, and they began their nuclear program formally out loud around the time of the invasion of Iraq, where they publicly announced that they were developing, um, they were trying to develop a nuclear weapon. At first, they probably were bluffing and blew up a whole bunch of um, uh, conventional weapons just to sort of make everyone think that they had a nuke. But they said, quote, we do, we, we do not want to suffer, quote, the same miserable fate as Iraq's. So they understand that if they disarm, they're going to be attacked. And you know, Joseph Gerson talked before about, you know, when there's a, a pistol in a robbery, even if it's not fired, it's used. Well, you know, the nuclear arsenal of the United States has been used as a threat against North Korea for decades. And now that they have 
have a nuclear weapon, or several probably, they want to negotiate on equal terms. And that's the process that's happening now. Um, President Moon from South Korea, the Republic of Korea, ran largely on reconciliation with the North. Um, he won an election um, and has basically followed through. He's, he's gone back on a couple things, but he's essentially followed through. And the uh, Olympics has, have given a real opportunity um, for a reconciliation of this peninsula that was divided in, in, in an act of imperial aggression, um, you know, 70 plus years ago. Um, and you know, I would argue that, pe that peace activists in the United States ought to look to peace activists in South Korea. So there's a slogan among peace activists in South Korea, which is, no peace without sovereignty. And so what they mean by that is that for there to be peace, South Korea needs to stop behaving like a, a, in essentially an imperial puppet of the United States. They want the United States to back off. So what can we do as activists here? Well, you know, we've done a whole bunch of actions about Korea. We've had watch parties for um, the Olympics opening ceremonies, which of course are really beautiful to watch the women's hockey team walk together. Um, we have had an, an action called Athletes for Peace. Um, we've done a bunch of rallies and things like that. Um, so please, you know, engage with Massachusetts Peace Action if you want to learn more about um, ongoing Korean actions. But some of the things that we could be pushing for as peace activists, um, so for one thing is to stop the large scale military uh, exercises that happen off the Korean coast twice a year. Um, you know, these are extremely threatening to North Korea. Uh, understand that the, the, the aircraft carriers that were off the coast during the Korean War ran 24-hour saturation carpet bombing. Um, and when they see those aircraft carriers, they remember that. Um, and by the way, it's good news, but the, you know, it's not good news that the exercises are going on, but they are going on, they're going to proceed, but they are significantly reduced, which is a good sign, actually, from the Trump administration that they are at least taking material steps to de-escalate, and that includes no aircraft carriers, which is good news. Um, and so we, we should be pressuring our, our leadership to um, engage and to back off and to let Moon take, um, take the wheel. So even our, our most liberal reps um, argue as though North Korea is this threat that's about to come conquer us. The United States Pacific gives the odds of a first strike from North Korea, the DPRK, at 0.01% just as another example of the, the understanding within the intelligence community that their weapons are defensive. Um, Young Suk Lee of CIA's Korea Mission Center um, argues that nu nukes are a deterrent and that Kim Jong-un is not irrational. He says, quote, the last person who wants conflict on the Korean Peninsula is Kim Jong-un. Um, so, you know, what we should be doing is to sign a peace treaty to officially end the Korean War, which again is not officially ended. Uh, it ended in an armistice, um, which we've broken the terms of repeatedly, by the way. So uh, there was a, um, you know, paragraph 13D of the armistice agreement said no new weapons are introduced into the Korean Peninsula. And of course, we introduced nuclear weapons in 1958 broke it almost right away in a very serious manner. Um, so that's part of why the, the, the DPRK government doesn't trust us. Staying the, in the Iran deal will help uh, credibility. Uh, if we back out of that, they'll realize they can't trust us, and I'm probably about done. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mike.